For our purposes this morning, we're going to start in Leviticus 18 in a few moments and on lesson number one. Thank you for being here. If you will, bow your head with me. Let's have a word of prayer and then we will get into our study for the morning. Father in heaven, we recognize you as the creator, the, the shaper, the owner, the judge of all of us. We humble ourselves before you and readily confess that we are unworthy to approach you. But by the blood of your Son and the grace and the mercy that you have shown to us, we joyfully come before you, and we thank you for this opportunity. Father, thank you for all of the blessings of this past year and all of the potential, if you will, of this new year. We pray for a closer walk with you. We pray that you would do what you must do to help us grow, to shape us for your glory. We pray for growth as individuals, we pray for growth as families, and we pray for growth as a congregational family. We pray that your blessing would be on all of our endeavors this year. We pray that we would be built up, that lights would shine in this community, that others may see our good works and come to give glory to you. And we pray that you would be magnified more and more as we are shaped more fully into conformity with Christ. Thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning and Lord willing throughout this quarter to focus on the, the bedrock principle of authority. Help us to be humble and reverent and receptive, help us to treat your word as it really is, breathed out by you and profitable for everything that we need for every good work. Help us to be people of this book and chiefly people who are of Christ every day, everywhere. Please be with all who are studying and teaching throughout this building this morning. May everything that we do here today be encouraging to us and glorifying to you. It's in the name of our risen Savior that we pray. Amen. Okay, one more time. If you need material for this morning, if you would raise your hand high so that Eric can see it. And if you have not already, turn back with me to Leviticus chapter 18. You can see on just inside this packet a syllabus for where we hope to be throughout the next three months. Just very briefly note that with me if you have not already. This morning we are asking what is authority and why does it matter? Over the course of the next two weeks, we hope to look at the way that God authoritatively communicated expectations in the Old and the New Testament. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of our time together this morning. Uh, Lord willing, three weeks from this morning, we want to talk about what the Bible calls lawlessness, why that is a big deal and the consequences that come with lawlessness. In week number five, we're just going to talk about the essence of communication, how that works. And we're going to uh, just go back to the real raw materials and, and apply what we take for granted in communication to the way that God has communicated His will to us. We'll talk about the nature of His written revelation to mankind. We'll talk about the intersection of heavenly authority and everyday life. What do we do when it's time to make a judgment call? What about when God hasn't said anything about uh, what to do or, or how to do it? How should we respond to His silence? Living in the light of God's authority as an individual disciple of Christ, worshiping in the light of God's authority as a church, working in the light of God's authority as a church, and then traveling these ancient pathways in what is frequently referred to as a postmodern age. We've got a lot of ground to cover, and we're looking forward to a good and a, a meaty 
practical study, a very much needed study this quarter. We hope that you'll join us throughout the quarter on Sunday mornings. This morning, as you can see up at the top there, January 5th, we are covering what is authority and why does it matter. We've got a dictionary definition up there at the top to get us kicked off. Authority is the power or the right to determine. It is the power or the right to control to command, to judge, to prohibit the action of others. Authority is dominion. Authority is jurisdiction. But this is first thing on Sunday morning, and so let's not just rest on a a, a wordy dictionary definition. In your own words, when you think of authority, these are the big philosophical ideas behind authority, but in our own words, in just everyday vernacular. What is authority? What do you think of when you think of authority? Nancy? Authority means the person has a last word. Okay. The person in authority has the last word. It's a good way of putting it. Other thoughts. It's what you think of when you think of authority. He also has the first word. He has the first word. He is the beginning and the end. He is the definer of what is involved with this. Alan, go ahead. Well, that's like a relation to a Bible class we had last Sunday. Okay. Called the holiness. Absolutely. Spiritual sense. The reason that we spent the last three months on Sunday mornings talking about holiness, and we began by noting that God is holy and He calls us to be holy, the reason that matters is authority, right? In truth, everything that we talk about throughout the year will really rest on this bedrock foundation of authority. There is a God who created us and he cares about how we live and he's going to hold us accountable and he's clearly communicated what he expects. Now what? Well, what we do is in many respects going to correlate with how we handle his authority. If we don't handle his authority very soundly, if we just take that for granted or we take it with a grain of salt, then really the sky's the limit. Right, We can do whatever it is that we want to do as individuals, as families, as a congregation. But if we take his authority seriously, if we approach this from the standpoint, he has communicated what he wants and he expects us to walk within those boundaries. Now, we're not in the driver's seat, right? We are the recipients. We are the hearers and it is up to us not to pave the trail but to follow, right? Belinda, did you have your hand raised? Go ahead. I think God is a God of order. Okay. So no without that order, you have to have authority and the basis Absolutely. Absolutely. We had in, in that second paragraph, just building on that idea, we depend upon order every day, don't we? Not just in religious context, but in all context. We expect at this point in our society order. And maybe we find it a little easy to be a little lax when it comes to ourselves, but we all want other people to live by order, right? We find it easy maybe to cut corners here and there, but when I'm looking at you and and how you're going to treat me, I I want us to live uh, from the standpoint of order and rules and authority, right? Uh, We understand that's rather hypocritical. If I expect it of you, then I also need to be a person of fairness and of order, submitting to authority. We've got in that second paragraph, we interact with authority every day. We submit ourselves to authority every day. We depend on authority every day. At the gas pump, right? If you see the sign as to what gas is per gallon and you pull in and it's 339 on the sign, but you're getting charged 439, are you going to make a big deal about that? 
Yeah, you're going to make a big deal about that. You're going to go in and you're going to ask, what's going on? And why are you going to do that? Because you expect to be charged based upon what is advertised on the sign. That's only fair, right? That there is some sort of a communication, there is expectation, and I act according to that expectation, and I expect the consequence of my action to match what's on the sign. If it's not, we get really hot and bothered, don't we? In very, very practical terms, we depend upon authority in the grocery store. We expect the food that we buy to live up to a certain sort of a standard. Those of us who pay twice as much for organic food expect it to really be organic, right? Those of us who buy gluten-free food truly expect it and depend upon it to be gluten-free food. And if it's not, we're going to get upset because there was an authoritative standard, there was an expectation that was advertised, and there are consequences that go along with that when we look at a clock how is it that all of us just happened to be here at 9 45 this morning some of us 9 46 or 9 47 but that's all right we're glad you're here Uh, how, how is it that that happened right because we are all submitting to a common standard of authority when we use money The amount of zeros in our paychecks matters, right? Uh, When we got here safely driving and when we drive home, we're depending upon standards of authority. The drugs that we get at our pharmacies, we get the idea. We depend upon all of that. That fourth paragraph, standards of authority have power to teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train. And the big premise of this study is that's not man's idea. We didn't come up with that. That's not a product of evolution. That came from our Heavenly Father who is a God of order. When different people with differing ideas and varying histories and conflicting agendas agree to abide under a common standard of authority, we can be unified, right? We can all head in the same direction. We can all devote ourselves to the same sort of cause. And great purposes can be realized. There's potential for peace and for constructive coexistence we can settle disagreements by appealing to the common standard of authority we can have a clear vision for what we want to accomplish as individuals and as a group but it all depends upon appealing to a common standard of authority we've got our bibles open there to leviticus chapter 18 With those simple principles in mind, our material called for us to look at a couple of key passages, real foundational passages in the Bible to show this isn't just applying, we're not just depending upon this at the gas station or in the grocery store or at the pharmacy. This is just bedrock creation. In Leviticus chapter 18, for instance, read carefully with me some of the words that this God of order spoke to the nation of Israel. Leviticus 18 and verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where this people had been for the last 400 years. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan where he was taking these people. The land that he had promised all the way back to their forefather Abraham. You shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Now, we'll get to us later on. 
We'll talk about how, how all of this directly relates to us. But just from the standpoint of this ancient communication with these people, God is still very much revealing himself to this newly freed people, right? He's building them up. He's taken them like an infant and he's giving them everything that they need to grow and to develop into the nation that he wants them to be. In a nutshell, what's he saying here? In Leviticus 18 verses 1 through 5. Let's just keep this very simple. In just a few words, what's he saying? I'm going to be boss. I'm the boss. Uh, It's hard to distill it into fewer words than that, right? I'm the boss. I'm the one who liberated you from Egypt. I'm the one you look to. Zippy, go ahead. Don't be doing what the other folks are doing. Doing a totally different Yeah. There are other standards of behavior. Not everybody is doing what I want them to do. But just because other people are doing it doesn't make it right. I mean, that, that's an ancient concept that is still very, very, very relevant, right? There are other ways that other people are living and functioning and worshiping and living their lives. Don't follow their lead. I'm the boss. Follow my lead. Alex, go ahead. This is the sort of thing the father would say to his children. Absolutely. Yeah. I have standards. You're going to follow my letters. Yeah. Where do we learn or where ought we to learn by God's design from the earliest of ages, the bedrock principle of authority at home? right? It is not society's job to teach me the most basic lessons of authority. It's not the church's job, first and foremost, to teach me the most basic form of authority. That, by God's design, ought to begin at home. And if it's not learned, eventually society will impress upon me the the importance of submission to authority, but it ought to begin at home with moms and dads. And this is the way that a father authoritatively would speak to his children. Alan? This applies today. Sure. And forever. Absolutely. And the Bible is our passport to heaven. Absolutely. God is trying, as we said over and over again last quarter, God is not trying to keep good things from us. He's trying to show us the best way possible. Very straightforward in Leviticus 18. Not this, this, because I'm the boss. Okay, let's turn a page or two over to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 1. Much the same sort of thing, tying in very well to where we were last quarter. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Again, notice the last phrase. I'm the boss. I'm the creator. I'm the one who liberated you. I'm the one who is providing manna and water in the wilderness for you. I'm the one who is engineering this wonderful plan that that you and your nation have been invited to play a part in. Listen to me. Follow my lead. Be like me and not like the world around you. Not everyone was or is interested in being holy. But that's not my standard of authority. That's not any excuse for me not to listen to the Creator who has authoritatively spoken. It's a principle that's reiterated in the New Testament that we return to a number of times this quarter. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, beginning, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, to Alex's point. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, 
you shall be holy for I am holy. Look with me at the bottom of page four in our material, that last full paragraph. Why would God act as if he has the right to define, command, prohibit, and judge? Why, would, why should we feel compelled to be as he is? Well, that's not hard to answer from the Bible if we're listening carefully. He's the creator of all things. He is the giver of all good things. He is the owner of all things. He is the upholder of all things. He is the source of our spirits. Eventually, they're going to return to this God who gave them. He is the founder of the nations. He is the ruler of all peoples. He is the judge of every person. We're all going to stand before His judgment seat. All things were created by Him and through Him and for Him. Isn't that what Paul is communicating in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15? Specifically speaking of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, or we could interject me and you and everybody else. All things were created through him and for him. We asked in the material, how do those words inherently imply ultimate authority. He created all things. They were created through him and they were created for him. What's that mean, Alex? Let's say I go home today. Mm-hmm. I have about nine miles of the computer. Okay. And I put that computer together and I have a purpose for my wife that computer together. Okay. If for whatever reason that computer does not the purpose for which I built it, I'm going to throw it out. But it's <laughs> okay. not serving its purpose. Yeah. God takes that a step further because I have to buy things or you stop the phone in existence to build what I built. Sure. He built it by the very word of his mouth from things that do not exist. He has ultimate ownership and control over everything in the universe because he ordered it and put it together okay. for the purpose of his work. He ordered it. He put it together, and according to verse 17, he holds it together, right? We leave him out of our thinking, and we are leaving out the biggest piece imaginable, and we will do it to our own harm and destruction. Gordon? Don't you think we have a tendency to, when we think of the master builder, Mm -hmm. Of thinking of self too much. Sure. And there's really only one master building. Why, why would we not want right. to follow him, especially when we see his love, we see what he's created? Sure. It just. Absolutely. You know, it, in, in um, uh, Job 38 sorts of terms, if God challenges us to build something, and we start to build, uh, what's he going to tell us? Maybe one of the very first things is, no, you can't use that or that or that. That's mine, right? Uh, We can't even build a sandcastle without using what God has provided, right? He created it all. He ordered it all. He upholds it all. And if we ignore him, we are the ones who will suffer, right? Up at the top of page five, we ought not to be surprised then that this is the way he talks about himself and this is the way that he talks about us because it's only right. It's only logical if all of these other things that we've brought up from God's word are true. Isaiah 55 and verse eight, he unashamedly says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think like you. I don't make judgments like you make judgments. I don't plan like you plan. I don't purpose like you plan. And the reason that that's true is, of course, we've got such a very, very finite space to work with. 
such a, a limited understanding on which to build or fashion whatever it is that we're doing. Not him. Not in the least. His ways are not our ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the last few minutes of our time together, it's very important for us to to put this in extremely practical terms. All of this leads to my feelings are not the standard of authority. Now, I, I mean, every single one of us sees that having spent the last 25 minutes building this little foundation. We all see that. But how very easy it is for us on Monday morning, or Tuesday afternoon, or whenever, to live as if my internal compass is the biggest thing that matters when it comes to decision making. It's not. And if I treat it as if it is, I will get myself in a world, an eternity's worth of trouble, right? My feelings, my hunches, my goals, my judgments, my opinions, the way I think things ought to be done, that's not the standard of authority. It doesn't work in all of those other things that we talked about from the top, right? We're not any of us going to pull into the, the, the lot of a gas station and say, I see that it's three thirty nine, but I'm interested in paying 99 cents because I remember when it was 99 cents, right? When I was driving as a teenager, I can remember 99 cents. Many of you can remember much, much, much cheaper than that, of course. But I can't go in to a gas station and say, listen, I'm only paying 99 cents and I'm going to take a tank's worth of gas. That's not going to work, is it? Doesn't matter how I feel about it. Doesn't matter what I remember. Doesn't matter what my hunches or opinions or goals are. The standard is the standard. And if we see that when it comes to frivolous things like gasoline, all of the frivolous things that we take for granted, they're built on these great defining truths. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. I can't trust myself as the ultimate standard of authority. And if I do, it's going to lead in very bad directions. My personal past experiences are not the ultimate standard of authority. I'm not going to be able to get to this great judgment seat of God and appeal to my past as the standard of authority. How do we know that? Well, the Son of God communicated that to us. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Because I'm not the standard. He is. On that day, we've already been told, many will say, Lord, did we not in the past tense prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Why will he say that? Because we're not the standard. And if we act as if we are, we're making ourselves a law unto ourselves. And God is not happy with that. We'll make that loud and clear using his word over the course of the next few weeks. My relatives are not the ultimate standard of authority. The standard laid this out in very stark terms. I can't love father or mother more than him. And if I do, it's not going to go well for me. Of course I can love them. Of course I can respect them. Of course I can build my life on many of the things that they taught me. But what they taught me is not the ultimate standard of authority. The majority, as we've already brought out, is not the ultimate standard of authority. Jesus said you enter by the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. 
The crowd is headed to destruction. Don't follow the crowd, Jesus said. Religious leaders are not the ultimate standard of authority. Jesus said of people of his own day and age, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. That's a big deal. We don't want to hear that when we stand before him in judgment. Other people are not the ultimate standard. Can we learn from each other? Of course we can. Can we help each other and and sharpen each other? Absolutely we can. But God and God alone is the ultimate standard. My own conscience, what I feel on the inside, that's been shaped by all sorts of things, right? And it's God-given And it can keep me out of a whole lot of trouble and it can lead me to what is good. But I can be fully convinced this is the way to go and I can be wrong. Saul of Tarsus is the great example of that from the Bible. No, God, the creator, the owner, the upholder, the ruler, the judge of all is the ultimate standard of authority. And listen, this is why we're going to spend the next three months talking about this. It's because he is the ultimate standard of authority and he has spoken. He is not silent. He has spoken. He has revealed his will and preserved it in his gracious providence for us. And even 2,000 years later, we rest on this truth that what he has delivered through the the apostles and the prophets and, and Jesus Christ as the foundational cornerstone, it is there for our good, for our teaching, for our reproof, for our correction, and for our training, that we might be complete, equipped for every good work. 